I'm Urvashi Sani and uh, I live in Lucknow, which is in Uttar Pradesh, which is in northern India and it, the state that borders Nepal. Um, I've been working since 1983 and I founded educational institutions and an institution for women's rights, which was actually the first institution I ever founded in 1983. It's called Suraksha and it's an institution for, it started as a distress cell and now has grown to be a, an organization that works for, again, works for women all over UP. And um, in 1986, I founded Study Hall School and then has spawned several others. So we have Prerna, which is a school for girls from urban slums, and there's Vidyasthali, which is a school for children from rural areas. There's Dosti, which is a school for children with special needs. And then there's Didi's, which is an organization which works at sustainable livelihoods for women and tries to empower them by using their skills to earn them a living and so learn to express themselves as equal people in their homes. My first degree is in philosophy. And the idea was really to think of life and find the meaning of life and to find the meaning of my own life and why I'm there. That was something that really tortured me since school and I would read a lot of philosophical texts and fiction that was the central question that I would keep asking of every text that I read. I really find that my own life is the best teacher and I keep looking for answers through well, what is happening and how do I make sense of life. I found that uh, really it is because I pushed education for myself so hard despite odds that I became, that I found a self, that I was able to construct one, that I was able to push the limits and boundaries of my life. And so I thought, you know, education is an important thing, but I knew that it wasn't being done right. I felt I had a good education, I went to a very good school. At the same time, I don't know that I learned a lot, except to read and write. I didn't think that it answered any of my existential questions. It didn't teach me who I was, most importantly. It didn't teach me that I was an equal person. I had to find that out. I got the skills. I didn't know that I had the right to use the skills for myself. It didn't teach me that I had a right to my own life. And I said, these are important questions that people leave out. So education should really be about this. It should be about the self. It should be about how we relate to the self, uh, to the world. And in fact, the world is important because we are who we are because it is connected to us, to finding connections. And it was the search of that that led me to found the school in 1986. And in terms of a turning point, there have been many, there hasn't been one. The reason for founding the women's organization, you know, my cousin, my first cousin, at 24, burnt herself to death. We still don't know whether she did it herself or that was her dying declaration or it was murder. That shocked the wits out of me because my first thought was, God, that could have been me and you know, it's not going to be me. And my aunt said, boy, girls these days have no tolerance. And my sister-in-law, one generation above me, she says, God, she's liberated, good for her. And I thought to myself that why did she have nowhere to go? Why could she not talk to someone? Why wasn't there anyone there to help her? Which is when I thought I would set up, that was a turning point of one kind, where I thought you should do something about these things, not just think about them. And I set up, a, I thought I would just set up a distress cell at home, man the phone, I would publicize the number, and if people wanted, I would talk to them. You know, youth is young. And it was then there were wiser heads around this, and no, no, we should found an organization. And then I founded this organization, which for the first four years I really worked very hard at. I st and I st with, as part of the organization, I realized that it was, there was much more than just firefighting. That how about educating people towards this? And I started to run workshops in schools for girls about thinking about marriage, thinking about their lives, thinking why they did it, and trying to see themselves as equal people. At the time, it, they were just workshops. I hadn't thought of critical dialogues. I was really very young. That was one turning point in where I started off working at women's rights, but I saw education as a way of doing it, along with firefighting. So it was a distress cell. We were trying to work with legal policy makers as well. We were trying to have protests. We were trying to work with individual cases, counseling them. 
and ours was the first family counseling cell in UP. There were there's some many people who are influential in uh, doing that. One is uh, Ahilya Chari, who is was the founder, one of the directors and a contemporary of Krishnamurti, and I was so fortunate to meet her. And we started a conversation by mail. And then she came to visit me and then she says, you know, you're so interested in education. At the time, I was talking to a lot of people, to parents, to teachers, to principals and asking them what they thought was wrong with the current system. Everybody thought there was a lot that was wrong, that it didn't address student needs, it was irrelevant, it was abusive, but everyone thought it was somebody else's fault, not that they couldn't do anything about it. So she said, well, you should start a school. I said, oh, you must be kidding, absolutely joking. I have no B.Ed. She said, yeah, but you have all the right questions. What I did was, in fact, I found it, I made a course on, uh, you would, she called it life values. I, it was, to me, it was a course in philosophy, in Socratic dialogues, really. And the idea was, let's question things and let's see why we should be moral. Let's see why we should be good at all and what does good mean? All the questions that ethics ask. And I took it to Loreto Convent because the school right next door. And I said I wanted to experiment and do it with class 11 and 12 girls. And the nun looked at it and she really liked it. She called it life value. She said, go ahead. When I started, I realized very soon that it was way above the student's head. Because one of the students came and told me, she says, you know, can you do something easier? This is really hard to understand. I said, oh my God. So then I gave them a box. I said, put in all your concerns. And they did. And then I developed each question into a little module and started to work with it like that. And boy, they loved it. There were 80 girls, you know, and they were all engaged. We talked about sex. I kept a stern eye on the door so that the nun wouldn't walk in. And uh, they talked about freedom, responsibility, discipline, corruption, social activism, the self, many things. And it really worked. In 1989 is when I thought of, uh, I wanted to learn more. And you know, at that time, actually, my husband made it possible. He fought me on many issues. He didn't want me to do my first master's, and he said that, uh, you know, it'll ha affect our marriage. He doesn't have a master's. But in this case, he said, well, why don't you go and, you know, we'll take care of the kids. I said, ready? So I did apply, and I got into Berkeley, Chicago, and Harvard, all three, and Urbana. But I chose Berkeley because, one, it was cheaper. Two, it was warm and sunny, and I'd heard it was radical. And I said, that's where I really want to go. And God, I'm so glad. And there I met this other woman, another tipping point. This was Anne Dyson. I only went for a master's, by the way. And she really mentored me by many things. One, she valued every, all the knowledge that I brought and uh, told me that it was very valuable. She really respected me a lot. And she responded to all my needs. And so I really learned through the way she treated me as a student, what education should all be all about. And she's the one who really brought to me to this idea of how it's really a relationship. Education is about relationships. It was nascent, but she brought it out to the fore. And after I finished, and I again, the other layer that Berkeley added, and I have to give them the credit for that. One, they helped me respect my own culture much more. Secondly, they sh I learned from, because it was a public school, so I really did well, I think, going to a public school. I learned uh, to look at education in a social and political context, and to understand that it's much bigger, that pedagogy is not neutral, that it is very political, it is very social. And you have to look at it, you, it meant me expand my lens really and it added layers of complexity to my thinking. I wasn't, didn't have a PhD in mind, she pushed me. She said, no, I want you to do a PhD. And then I did my PhD and I decided then to do my uh, dissertation in a rural school because I said I want to learn about 70% of India is in the village. I want to learn about rural education and about the lives. They were almost as foreign to me as America. I still didn't have a vision for it at all. By now the vision was developing and I worked in a rural school right very close to where we are sitting just now. It was the second grade, it was under a tree, it was a public school and my topic was that how would second grade children in a rural Indian school develop a language arts curriculum if they could do it themselves. And my point was to work with them, to follow their cues and to really follow their lead. And what do you know? They came up, we came up with a curriculum that was based on story, drama, dance and poetry. Well in line with 
with global research at the time. So from the mouth of babes, right? And that really taught me a lot about rural setting, about the culture there, about students' needs and how they really like students anywhere in the world. And then UNICEF engaged me with, uh, I was again very fortunate to be able, the other tipping point came when uh, they asked me to help consult on a very large scale project, training first grade teachers on joyful learning. And these are teachers in very rural remote settings. Oh man, it was a year and a half and I was like a traveling salesman. I would travel 20 days a month. And I, there was this five day training that we developed into very performance space. It was very exhausting, but I worked with at least personally with 2000 teachers and the whole training impacted 80,000 teachers, right? So that was again a huge learning about the terrible shape of public school education in India and, and even teachers. So that one thing led to another and so my whole vision of education had expanded by now, right? And that's what led to in 2005 turning Vidya Sthali into a full-scale school and the vision behind that was to have a self-sustaining, high-quality, low-cost rural school. Well, it's high-quality and it's low-cost, it's not self-sustaining. We're still trying subsidizing it and I found a funder to do it. But the good news is that we're learning and I'm hoping that we'll get there eventually. You know, I'm most proud of uh, two things. One is my uh, you know this sounds very narcissistic but let me still say it. One is to have found myself and to have struggled and stayed with the struggle and to have built it painstakingly over the years and had the courage to also to find myself. It, I, I didn't have it for a long time and it took a very, it was, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done. It's been the hardest thing. Because in India, you're not expected to have a self. And in fact, there's everything that teaches you not to have a self. And you're made to feel very guilty if you want to have a self. It's meant, it's had a fallout. I've been divorced in the process. I think my daughters have had to suffer the brunt of that. I think my parents have had to suffer the brunt of that. But at the same time, it seemed important enough to do despite all of this, despite all the guilt. But that was very, very hard to do. And the second thing that I'm very proud of, and it's actually an extension of that, is my Prerna school, which is a school for girls from urban slums. And I think I've been able to use all my own, the learnings from my struggle to work with those students to help them build themselves and have the courage to fight against all odds. And actually, luckily for them, you know, it took me decades. It's taken them years. It's taking them years. And within years, we are seeing the difference in these girls, how they found their voice, how they have aspirations, how they think of themselves as, as equal people and are able to assert themselves. Oh my God, I can't tell you how my heart sings with joy for that. That is really something that, not just proud, I'm just joyous about that. So I won't even say proud. I don't know that there's any pride in that. It's just fun and it's just, you know, it's just, I rejoice in that. How has, how has my work made my love visible? I think my work has made my struggle visible too. And it's made my, it's made my love for life visible, definitely. And my love for people visible. And the love for my country. Helping students find a meaningful, expression of themselves through their work, right? Helping them find a way to peace, make sense of life so that it's meaningful, right? Helping uh, students find a way to make sense of themselves and in terms of girls to find a self, right? And uh, in that sense, it's made, my work has made my love for meaning and for a meaningful life 
visible. One is really, it's an old one, but be true to yourself. First of all, know yourself, be true to yourself. Really very important. And I'm a great believer, and this I think comes from my father, in good, solid, hard work. And uh, finding a way to make your life productive and having a very expansive understanding of yourself so that it includes not just you, not just your family, not just your community, not just your nation, but the universe. And that your life should really, you should embrace the world and you should embrace everyone in it. And you should have an ever expanding sense of yourself so that even when you think of your life as being for yourself, it should include all these people. And it should touch as many people as you can in whatever, whatever you have to give. Give it generously, bountifully and give it to as many people as you can. Growth in this sense, a growth of the self, deeper, wider, all embracing self is what I would and that's what I tell my students too that uh, I don't want to see you become these narrow careeristic people that's not what education is for and that will not gladden my heart when I meet you 20 years from now you know but it will gladden my heart if I see you doing something meaningful where you're actually touching many lives through whatever you're doing and you're loving your work and that you have a sense of joy that you bring to your work so joy is a great value too I think life is beautiful you should enjoy it I think we need to change gendered norms and gendered attitudes. Uh, again, as I told you, when I started my work with Suraksha, it became a multi-pronged effort, right? So you have, uh, you need better laws, though they are becoming better and better every day for Indian women because of the women's movement, right? You need better opportunities. You need more, edu more inclusion of girls in education. But that again boils down to gendered norms. So you need to educate a new generation in equality, in understanding, in getting an understanding of patriarchy and how it is an unequal structure. And in learning to love equality, learning to understand equality, learning to aspire for equality. So you need a paradigm shift. And so educators have a very strong role to play. And I do believe that if you want to update your curriculum, our curriculum is out of date. It needs to include a whole lot on social, political, moral thinking, which we are not doing. The government is not thinking of that. Private people like us are doing it, right? So you need girls to think about gender very clearly. You need boys to think about gender. And you need these critical dialogues happening all over the country. We are in a transitional place. At least the middle classes are and we have an expanding middle class. And if there are more educators who can think of uh, girls' education differently, so that it's not just access, but it is gender education that we need to provide, and boys that we need to think of them, and talk to them about gender, and help, help deconstruct gendered notions in their heads, I think there's scope for change, and it will happen. I would liberate women from very restrictive notions of domesticity and their roles as just wives and mothers. I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks. And I would also liberate them from notions of, again, restrictive notions of virginity, chastity and sexual uh, constriction. That's the other sexual, that's the other stumbling block. I think once you liberate them from this and let them feel that they can be whoever they want to be, they can do whatever they want to do, that their bodies are their own to be shared with whoever they want to for love, right? And that they can be mothers and many other things if they want to, that they can be wives and many as equal partners if they want to. I think that is something that will help women, first of all, avail of more of the opportunities that there are. It will help them think differently, become entrepreneurs and embrace the world in a much, uh, in a much freer, equal way and powerful way. Right. 
I, okay, my idea of India is that it's a very complex, extremely complex mix of many things. It's got layers and layers of historical complexity, geographical complexity. So in one word, it's very complex, right? But I suppose many societies are. But it's the diversity that lends itself to that. And the religious diversity. And look at our history that we, we were never a nation. Actually, the British turned us into a nation, as did the Mughals. Some conquerors have come and done it. So we are still almost like Europe, with many little, 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 little countries, only we are a federation because of religion. And because Hinduism had its own issues with caste, then came Islam with its own issues, and then we had Christianity that came. So there is that complex intersection that we are working with, right? So it, we've carried many elements of our culture, even though we are now aspiring to modernity. So really India, I am hoping, will come out with its own definition of modernity, which will not be a replication of the West. That will be a shame. It should not have that. I think we should hold, uh, democracy is a great thing that we have learned from the West. India has not had a democratic history. But we've got it now. We can be, we are a thriving, vibrant democracy, not a fully functioning democracy, right? But still, we are a protesting, arguing, vibrant nation, and that's where our potential lies, if we can hang on to that. With the wider spread of education, with the march of time, and with the fact that there are all these external globalization, and the influences from everywhere, increased trade, increased exposure to our people from outside, people coming in, our people going out. I think we are moving towards modernity and because of our own traditions and the feudal hold is loosening, there's less tolerance for corruption, there's less tolerance for gender discrimination, there's less tolerance for uh, religious discrimination, all the remnants of our history. Uh, we will move towards our own definition of democracy. That is my fond hope. And definitely India is one of the rising stars of the world. And it's going to rise. They have to be visionaries. And they have to be an ever, and they have to be people of integrity. They have to be determined, almost stubborn. In and dog-headed about following and persisting with their vision and willing to learn and grow it. They have to be nurturing. They have to be caring. They have to care about their vision. They have to care about the people that they are leading. Care very deeply about them. And care very deeply about their goals, about the work they do, and about the people that they lead. And so if you were to, and you know what, if you were to just take one of those, if you can, you really care very deeply about the people you lead, that's what makes people follow you. And that's what makes people believe in your vision. And you have to not just care as in care, you have to express that care in your actions and in everything that you do.